بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اینڈ السلام علیکم ایوری ون گڈ ٹو بی بیک ود کارپریٹ گورننس اینڈ وی ور لوکنگ ایٹ دی کیڈبری رپورٹ لاسٹ ٹائم اینڈ ٹوڈے وی گوئنگ ٹو موو فارورڈ ود وٹ ٹینڈ ٹو سپلیمنٹ دا کیڈبری رپورٹ اینڈ وی سی دیٹ دی پال روتھ مین اینڈ دا گرین بری کمیٹی رپورٹس ٹینڈ ٹو فردر ری این فورس فائن ٹیون اینڈ آگمنٹ دی کیڈبری رپورٹ ناؤ وٹ ہیپنڈ از دیٹ وین دا کیڈبری رپورٹ کیم آؤٹ دے وار سرٹن آبزرویشنز وچ آر میڈ بائی دا ڈفرینٹ اسٹیک ہولڈرز وچ ریزلٹڈ ان سرٹن controversies emerging and based upon those controversies and the various trends which were seen in the corporate sector these two committees basically were constituted and they took the corporate governance regulations and the corporate governance stipulations uh, many steps ahead now what we see in the Ruth Smith committee is is that it was to deal with the controversial points of the Cadbury report it restricted the reporting requirement to internal financial controls only against the effectiveness of the company's system of internal control. So what we see, ladies and gentlemen, is that when we are talking about the effectiveness of the uh, company's internal control system, then it is very, very important that it is limited to the domains of internal control and it does not talk about all different dimensions of control. So to streamline the Cadbury report, The Ruthman report basically gave this recommendation that it should be limited to internal controls and secondly, the company's effectiveness based upon these internal controls became the stipulation uh, which emerged from this particular committee. Now, when we talk about the final report which was submitted, the committee had some progressive elements, notably the extension of the director's responsibilities to all relevant control objectives including business risk assessment and minimizing the risk of fraud. So what we see is that even though it focused upon the internal controls, but yet it also expanded the director's uh, responsibilities to ensure that all relevant control objectives, which would be covering risk assessment and also uh, minimization of risk of fraud were also encapsulated within Uh, the job description and within the responsibilities of the different directors. So this was uh, a major way forward and it was notably something uh, which uh, was very significant and also attributed to the uh, reinforcement of the Cadbury report. Now, what we see is, is that when we are talking about the Greenberry committee, then this committee also was formed to basically again analyze and look at some undulations and some uh, infrequencies within the corporate setup. And the most important one was that in the 1990s, we see that because many public utilities were privatized, therefore, we see that uh, the pay structure of the CEOs and of the, of the directors uh, multiplied many fold and in some instances became astronomical and were actually a matter of great concern because most of the profits were being consumed in the salaries of the CEOs and the directors. While on the other hand, what we see is, is that the lower staff and uh, the, 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 the number of uh, human resource was also uh, limited and constricted and restricted. So therefore, there was a big gap between the senior management and the board and the lower staff and their emoluments, their benefits, their remunerations, and also uh, the fact that uh, how they would be benefiting from the organization and this grab had exponentially grown and another thing that we see is is that the price of products and services was also increased so that the public sector companies would get more and higher profits and would be able to generate more profits throughout uh, throughout the whole process and that again was undermining one of the primary stakeholders which were the clients so what we see is to benefit one small stakeholder which is the top management, the other two major stakeholders were compromised and therefore this Greensbury committee basically came into existence to look into all of this, to analyze all of this and to rationalize this uh, relationship of remunerations, benefits, emoluments of all the different main stakeholders and also to see that there should be a level pricing field for the consumer also and it should not get out of hand. So that way, this Greensbury committee uh, is, is very, very important. And what we see is, is that 
uh, all these actions invited huge public and shareholder criticism about large listed companies. The issue of director's remuneration was also debated in the administration and corporate circles in England. So this became a major debate. And based upon this debate, this Greensbury committee basically came into existence, which was under Sir Richard Greensbury in 1995. He was the chairman of Marks and Spencer, one of the largest retail uh, store uh, companies uh, in the whole of UK. And the terms of reference of the committee was to identify uh, good practices in determining directors' remuneration and prepare a code of such practice for use by public limited companies in the UK. But even though it was for the public sector, but yet the private sector also benefited because these were very concrete recommendations. These were rationalized and very practicum focused recommendations. And also the gap between the top management, the middle management uh, and the lower management. And again, in relationship to the client base and what the client base was basically paying to the company, all of this was rationalized and therefore led to corporate governance and good governance. Now, uh, the committee focused the deliberations on the remuneration policy, the service conditions, the compensation of directors and disclosure of directors' compensation and code of best practices in this particular respect. So we see that all of this was streamlined by this particular committee and many rationalized uh, stipulations and regulations emerged which ensured uh, good corporate governance uh, in all of these organizations, primarily public sector, but also covering the private sector. Now, what we see is, is that the committee also recommended that all listed companies registered in the UK basically would be also covered through this code to the fullest extent practicable. Companies should include a statement about the compliance in the annual reports to shareholders and any areas of non-compliance should be explained and justified. So again, what we see is, is that the whole committee was able to come up with a stipulation of recommendations which rationalized the whole context and most importantly identified areas of non-compliance which would have repercussions for the top uh, management and also for those companies uh, under those internal audit uh, regimens. So this is uh, extremely uh, important and we see that in the context of compliance, we see the committee further recommended the London Stock Exchange would introduce the following continuing obligations for listed companies. So these two very important areas basically emerged in which we see that this annual remuneration committee uh, would be generating reports to the shareholders uh, in their annual report and also would have a complete section uh, explaining and justifying any areas of non-compliance. So this uh, was a major breakthrough uh, for uh, the benefit of all of the stakeholders and we see that uh, from this one, we see that uh, there were no secrets and there was nothing which was being uh, kept from all of the shareholders and the different stakeholders. The, the second point that we see is that uh, it would also cover the different provisions of the code and uh, what was seen is that any changes of working related to the technical reasons or to legal reasons would also be encapsulated within the particular code and that these legal and technical aspects would be covered by the corporate governance code of conduct. So what we see is, is that both of these reports uh, were very instrumental in taking uh, the corporate code of conduct forward and also rationalizing the Cadby report. And secondly, uh, the in, uh, inadequacies and the inequilibrium and the imbalance between the board of directors, the top management, uh, the middle management and the lower management. Uh, and all of uh, the stakeholders was basically uh, streamlined and rationalized. So this is the importance of these two uh, different reports, which added value in the context of corporate governance uh, throughout the world because they became international benchmarks and again uh, stipulations to be followed by countries around the world. Thank you so much.